All right, here we go. Chapter 6, Eurasian Social Hierarchies, 500 BCE to 500 CE. And of course, we'll be looking at the same empires that we have been looking at the whole entire time period. And so here we go. We're going to start with uh, the Chinese uh, classical state. So Chinese society was more shaped by state actions than were other societies. Immense social prestige and political power of state officials. Obviously, that's going to play a role by your legalism and especially your Confucianism that had a uh, social order to it. Officials as cultural and social elites obviously are bureaucrats holding that upper elite position. An elite of officials, world's first professional civil service. So again, getting into the examination system, getting into your Confucian education that had uh, been set in place. 124 BCE, uh, Wu Di established an imperial academy for officials. This is your uh, emperor at the time. He's going to be one of your more famous emperors of the Han Dynasty. And so around 30,000 students by the end of the Han Dynasty involved in that examination system. And they would even have multiple levels within the examination system to uh, have an extent of different levels within the bureaucracy that you could achieve. Written examinations used to select officials. They would use, uh, they'd be studying a lot of the Analects and classical books, uh, especially a lot of Confucian works. System lasted until the early 20th century, so it's going to last all the way until your communist state starts to emerge. All right, favored uh, the wealthy, obviously, even though it was based off of. Uh, merit, obviously there's still some positions that could be bought, obviously uh, positions that would be a little bit more favored, even if maybe the score wasn't what they wanted on one of the exams. Uh, closest to the capital, family connections were important. Obviously those that uh, were wanting their sons to work closer to the capital than being sent further away within the realm of the dynasty. It was possible for commoners to rise via the education, so this is uh, at least one of the pluses involved because Confucian was so uh, adamant upon education being important that if there was enough wealth, probably within a village to help pay for a poorer person to continue on, or if maybe this family uh, at least had some type of connection to an upper class person, might be able to get their son into the uh, education process. System developed further in the later dynasty uh, as more and more bureaucrat posi uh, bureaucratic positions were added. Bureaucrats had great prestige and privileges. Obviously, um, it, they would have coaches, um, and I mean coaches and vehicle, like the like the coach, the transportation wise, and uh, they would have tailors. They would be given some of the more finer cuisines of the time. And so if you could kind of picture somebody, maybe uh, your politician driving up in a limo or something like that, uh, also has like that aide with him that's taking all kinds of notes. This is, this is what I'm talking about for that prestige that they're having. The landlord class, uh, by the first century BCE, uh, small-scale peasant farmers had been displaced by large landowners and tenant farmers. So a lot of your uh, small agricultural units had now become more of a uh, landlord area where they had large, large farms with either tenant farmers or uh, they would uh, hire in people to come work on their farm. All right, state opposed creation of large estates throughout Chinese history without much success. They tried having land reforms. Wu Di, Wu Di even tried having some land reforms. And it was, it was a struggle between those landowners because they lost any type of political control, but they did hold a lot when it came to providing food for the dynasty and when it came to obviously um, uh, paying taxes to the family. So uh, that ended up hurting the dynasty when they would evade some of those taxes. Large landowners sometimes kept independent military forces that could challenge imperial authority. This is a especially something that occurred early on and then later in the Han Dynasty. Reforms by uh, the usurper Wang Meng, uh, which uh, those things were going well, 
until of course he passes away and then the next person comes in and obviously those are not continued on. The landowner procedure is based on both wealth and prestige of memberships in the bureaucracy. So this is your scholar gentry that you have. Uh, peasants in Chinese history, most of the population have been peasants, and we'll see this as a common theme throughout most of our empires, where the majority of your empire are made up of peasants. So that's a common theme that we're going to see. Some relatively uh, prosperous, some barely surviving. That was going to be based off of maybe the landowner they worked for or how much land they actually still owned themselves. Obviously, the further you got into the dynasty down the timeline, uh, the less land a lot of these uh, poor people ended up controlling. Tenant farmers in the Han Dynasty owned as much as two-thirds of crops to the landowners. And so that helped with some of their profits based off of how much land possibly the landowner actually had. Periodic peasant rebellions did occur, such as your Yellow Turban Rebellion in 184 CE, provoked by flooding and epidemics. So again, if uh, the, uh, the dikes or the dams were not being controlled by the emperor and being kept up with, if maybe they were putting money elsewhere, then obviously that was going to cause uh, some rebellions. Peasant revolts devastated the economy and contributed to overthrow of the Han Dynasty, which will be kind of their, their slow decline when the emperors are uh, more focused on imperial life and the court life that is occurring than they are actually keeping up with uh, the major river systems that China has. Chinese peasant movements were often expressed in religious terms as well, so Taoist Buddhists uh, will be involved in those processes. All right, and here is a, a map showing the Han Empire by 100 BCE, and there's your Yellow Turban Rebellion area that occurred early in the Han Dynasty. All right, Chinese cultural elite uh, disliked the merchants, and so merchants are actually lower. China will have probably the lower, uh, on the social ladder, the lower end for merchants than obviously India, who will be the highest. Uh, even the Greeks and Romans will be uh, next. Uh, the Persians will be higher up as well. But the Chinese uh, kind of stereotype them as being greedy or profiting from others because they were kind of that middleman person. Uh, they were seen as a social threat that impoverished other people because obviously they were trying to buy a good for as cheap as they could get it and then try and sell it for as much money as they could sell it. Uh, when you were a merchant uh, overseas as a Chinese merchant was, then it, it probably wasn't as bad for you, but you were still kind of looked down upon with your wealth that you did have in China. So if you ended up buying land or having a nice place to live, you may not have been incorporated within the elites due to the fact of the way that you gained your money. Periodic efforts to control the merchants uh, with certain laws, uh, certain types of state monopolies that existed so they couldn't have control over those, uh, not being allowed to hold any type of political office as well, um, sometimes either being uh, taxed really heavy on your loans or not even being able to be given loans for your job. Merchants often prospered anyway, though, because obviously Asian goods were something that was wanted elsewhere, and they normally had the money to get educated as well. So um, there, there was some idea of being able to prosper. All right, the, uh, the cast of Varna. So we are going to move on to India now and transition. And the key here is caste. And so while this obviously wasn't the term they used back then, this is again one of those historical things that comes about later on, it's important to note that India has a caste system. And there's a few other places in history that we might touch on where we talk about a caste system that has to deal with the, uh, the bloodline and the mobility within your social order. But it's important to note that India is the area that has the caste system. Our other places have a social order. So there is a little bit of a difference there. Uh, the caste may have involved from um, the Aryans, where you had more light-skinned versus natives, where they were more dark-skinned, and uh, to help keep that divide between them that might have existed. 
And so that kind of bloodline being traced back to your Indo-Europeans certainly grew from uh, interaction of culturally diverse peoples. And obviously, based off of those jobs that those culturally diverse people got is sometimes how you start to develop your caste system. Development of economic and social differences between them obviously had to do with those jobs. Economic specialization and culture apparently more important than notions of race because... Uh, they would deem maybe the unclean based off of your type of job than necessarily your skin tone or color. Uh, around CA means circa, which is around 500 BCE, there was clear belief that society was divided into four great classes, so your, your Varna, uh, with uh, position determined by birth, so three segments of pure Aryans, uh, the twice-born, which were your sutras, again, if I said that wrong, I totally apologize, it, native peoples in very subordinate positions. So the Varna theory, the four groups were formed from the body of the god Purusha, um, and you would have like your head, your body, your, your limbs, and so that's how they did, and then what was below your feet for your untouchables. So if you could kind of picture a body, that's how it ended up uh, working for you. And so... Um, that kind of describes your uh, social ladder there. And your Brahmins, of course, were going to be on top. Then you would have your uh, warriors and your uh, upper political class people maybe even involved with um, owning businesses. And then, of course, you'll have an area where you'll have your merchants and then your peasants and farmers. And then, of course, the very bottom would have been your untouchables. And so here you go. This is what you're looking at here. So your Brahmins will be up top. Uh, your warriors and politicians, kings will be next. Then your merchants and landowners that had some power. And then the last one, your commoners, peasants, and servants will be in that role. Uh, probably even artisans. That kind of varies uh, a little bit based off of uh, what type of artisan it was. And then, or he or she was. And then your untouchables which sometimes they don't really count as part of the caste system, and that's why it's even more below that. These are the people that you don't interact with, you don't speak of. Whereas in China, even though the artists were in the lower class, they still might, you might have seen them involved with the upper class as far as entertainment goes. Here, your untouchables, these are just the people that are involved with like cleaning the streets, keeping uh, bodily waste out of the streets, and the sewer systems and dealing with the dead and so they're going to be people that are deemed unclean and so therefore you don't have any contact with them all right so here's the the idea uh, the mouth would be your brahmins your arms would be your rulers and warriors your legs would be the peasants and traders and uh, merchants and then uh, your laborers would be the feet and then again, what was below the feet were your untouchables. All right, the caste as uh, jati, jati, uh, social, again, I'm horrible at these. I really got to work on it. Social distinctions based on specific occupations organized as guilds. And so this is going to be a break off within each caste that you have. And sometimes these might be blended a little bit. Uh, with the caste system based off of what type of job you had. But there was thousands of these. Uh, they did have some primary ones within your social life, but th these were your subcasts, and they were uh, greatly broken up and divided up. Uh, clearly defined social positions. You would have had uh, marriage and eating together only permitted within each individual's uh, jati, and... Uh, each one had its duties, rules, and obligations. And you can see how, because this continued to break down, you had your main cast and you had these subcasts, and then you had all these rules within them and how they interacted, how they ate together, how they worked together, what their obligations were to each other, who could marry, who could not marry. You can see why there wasn't a need for this elaborate administration that developed within the Chinese and even the laws within Rome and even your bureaucrats within Persia. So you can see why it wasn't developed as much here in India. Ideas of ritual purity and um, uh, pollution applied to the caste groups and so that evolved part of 
how you were being to, uh, divine, uh, sorry, defined. Uh, inherit inequality, uh, supported by the idea of karma, dharma, and rebirth, which were all involved in that. Birth into a caste determined by good or bad deeds of a previous life. So this is your reincarnation. That was happening, and that would determine part of your caste system. So this would be your only possible mobility that you would have within the caste system for India would be your... Uh, rebirth where uh, other places maybe due to marriage or education like in China maybe you could move up uh, if you married uh, what it was it was considered moving down so if a woman married a higher up male the male was moving down the social ladder you would not have seen the reverse for women that would just not have been allowed for a woman to marry a lower caste uh, male the the father would not have allowed that and so uh Again, if the marriage happens, it's going to be that male moving downward. Uh, the rebirth in a higher caste determined by performance of present caste duties, your dharma. Uh, threat of social uh, ostracism for violating rules, so that could move you down again. So there was mobility, but more or less going down the ladder, not getting so much that chance to rise. Uh, individuals couldn't raise social status, but whole jatis could improve social standings based off of maybe the evolution of their job getting improvement, but still the whole cast section itself would not improve. All right, uh, the functions of the cast. Cast was very local, so it focused loyalties on restriction in the territories in which you were in. It uh, made empire building very difficult. The Maureen had a little bit of a centralized state, and were able to function, but as the caste uh, continued to evolve and develop, especially under the Gupta, it made it very difficult and caused a lot of fragmented areas that you ended up having. And it also took really the place of that administration, and so you didn't have it. Castes also were supposed to take care of themselves with security and support, take care of the widows and the orphans and the destitute, and so that also took the need away the need for the government to provide for those people. The caste was a means to accommodate migrants and invaders as well, and it made it easier for wealthy and powerful to exploit the poor, so you didn't have any types of laws or ways that were being created by like people like in the Senate or your upper class, your upper class elites in, bureau in bureaucracy within Persia and China trying to uh, have some corruption involved to exploit the poor. It just automatically kind of happened due to the way the caste system was set up. All right, slavery in the classical era, the case of the Roman Empire, and so it's going to be uh, an area highlighted because it makes a uh, good comparison to why they were needing so much technology and uh, agricultural involvement, whereas um, for China, where China had all the technology, whereas in Rome they had all the slave labor for their agriculture. So it makes a really good comparison that we can look at. Uh, why did slavery emerge in the first civilizations? There are various theories, but uh, slavery has been around since the very beginning. Uh, domestication of animals provided a mode for human slavery. Uh, war, patriarchy, and private property ideas encouraged slavery. Women captured in war were probably your first slaves. Uh, patriarchal ownership of women may have encouraged slavery. So there's a multitude of reasons of why slavery might have developed, but it had been around uh, before empires had developed. And so even in places in China and in India, you did have this idea as well. But obviously it takes root heavily within the Roman Empire, which uh, has an influence over uh, Europe to a degree. Slavery as a social death, lack of rights or independent personal identity. Obviously some types of slavery uh, looked a little bit different. Obviously if you looked at the slaves in Egypt, it was going to be based off of who it was. You could look at slavery in the Bible within Egypt and uh, obviously Joseph and his story and how he actually had a whole lot more rights than a lot of people. So it is going to determine who maybe uh, the slave owner was and maybe even where the slavery was occurring. Uh, Roman Empire, Persia, what was going on with that. Slavery was a long established tradition by the time of Hammurabi uh, who will have some laws and how slaves should be treated. We'll also see this with the Old Testament and we'll even see it with the New Testament and how slaves should be treated. It was an issue because obviously slaves were mistreated 
to the degree in a lot of cases slavery was more like a um, uh, more like somebody paying off a debt in a lot of cases too and so how should that person be treated needed to be addressed Uh, you do have some uh, slave revolts that are going to occur. Uh, this is the route of your slave armies uh, where uh, there's going to be a massive uh, rebellion, a rebellion by Spartacus. There's a great movie. I wish we had time to watch uh, the, the old Spartacus movie. Not the new one. I don't like the new one. Um, same thing with 300. I like the old original better. But anyway, maybe I'm just old school. But uh, this is the slave route. They caused some problems for Rome. They burnt a lot of agricultural land. Um, they were very unified. They had a, a great military leader within Spartacus. And it took a long time for them to finally put down Spartacus and defeat him. And, of course, they're going to take uh, the body parts of them and uh, put them throughout the Roman Empire as a uh, reason not to rebel against Rome. So there's your power versus authority right there. All right, uh, almost all civilizations had some form of slavery, varied considerably over place and time, as I just mentioned. Classical Greece and Rome, slave emancipation was common, where slaves could be given freedom. Uh, the Aztec Empire, uh, children of slaves were considered to be free. Uh, labor of slaves varied widely, uh, how they were treated. Some of them were even allowed to earn money and maybe pay off debt or even just go and buy their own material goods. So less common in China, maybe 1% of the population, as I had mentioned previously. Uh, convicts and their families were the earliest slaves. Obviously, that was a form of punishment. Poor peasants sometimes sold their children into save slavery to help pay off maybe debt if they didn't uh, farm enough and didn't make enough money for that landowner. India, uh, criminals, debtors, war captives were slaves, uh, largely domestic Religion and law gave some protections within that part of it. Uh, society wasn't economically dependent on slavery, so you don't see as much. A little bit more than China, but again, it's a very low percentage compared to what we see in the Roman Empire. Uh, the making of the slave society, the case of Rome, uh, Mediterranean, Western civilization, slavery played an immense role. A lot of that having to do with agriculture and the need to have people working that area. Uh, Greco-Roman world was a slave society. Obviously, we, we already talked about this with Sparta and the reason that they chose their government based off of fearing the re, uh, revolts of the helots. Uh, one third of the population of classical Athens was enslaved. Uh, so they even had a large population, but again, you're going to see a larger one within um, Sparta. Aristotle, some people were slaves by nature, so being born into slaves and that type of work. At the beginning of the Common Era, Italy's population was 33 to 40% slaves, a lot of that due to starting to uh, capture certain areas within war. Wealthy Romans owned hundreds or thousands of slaves due to owning hundreds or 5,000 acres of land that was needing to be farmed. Uh, people of modest means often owned two or three slaves, uh, helping them work. Uh, it was cheap labor. You could send them down to the markets to run your booth that you owned. Uh, obviously, if you had some land that you were wanting farmed for yourself, you could own a few slaves. How people became slaves, massive enslavement obviously was uh, first uh, war, uh, piracy was involved, uh, long distance trade obviously uh, existed, uh, natural uh, reproduction based off of where you were, if children were freed or not freed, abandoned or exposed children obviously uh, being collected and used uh, within uh, slavery, not associated with a particular ethnic group originally, so that's something to keep in mind, uh, it had nothing to do with race. A little serious uh, social critique of slavery, even within Christianity. Slavery was deeply entrenched in the Roman society. Uh, slaves did all sorts of work except military service till later on. Uh, and that's where they start taking some of these Germanic tribes and allowing some of them to be involved in their military. That's how the military started to become weak. They started hiring mercenaries. And so it, it, the military struggled at the very, very end 
performed uh, both highly prestigious and uh, degrading tasks. So you had slaves used to educate some of the people. Obviously, if you captured a very uh, prominent family, obviously they might have some uh, high intelligence, and so you might use them as tutors in your society, or then, of course, they could be doing the lowliest of tasks as well. Slaves had no legal rights, uh, could not marry legally. If a slave murdered his master, all of his uh, victim slaves would be killed. Um, and so, uh, but it was also common, uh, Roman uh, freedmen uh, became citizens, and so it was possible um, to obviously get out of your slavery position. Uh, resistance and rebellion, uh, cases of mass suicide of war prisoners to avoid slavery, uh, weapons of the weak, uh, theft, sabotage, poor work, uh, curses, uh, flight, obviously uh, running away, uh, occasional murder of the owners, uh, rebellion, obviously Spartacus is the most famous, as you saw that map earlier on. Uh, nothing on the similar scale occurred in the West until Haiti in the uh, 1790s. So that uh, Spartacus Rebellion, uh, obviously uh, his defeat kind of uh, made it well known that you do not rebel or have a mass rebellion or you might lose. Uh, better to uh, rebel individually than have a mass rebellion because uh, that won't work. Uh, we're going to learn about the Haitian Rebellion, though, because it's the only successful one that occurred. Uh, they win their independence. So Rome, uh, Roman slave rebellions did not attempt to end slavery. Uh, participants just wanted freedom for themselves. So it wasn't a movement like we're going to see uh, with William Wilberforce later down the road in England and how he ends the slave trade, which fantastic movie. Uh, if you get a chance to watch Amazing Grace, take advantage of it and do that. Uh, every human community had created a gender system of some type, at least since the first civilizations, the re result had been more of a patriarchal society. Uh, men regarded as superior to women. Men had greater legal and property rights and marriage rights. Uh, public life was uh, male-dominated, especially in Athens, as we've seen. Polygamy was common uh, with sexual control of females of the family, um, including children. Notion that women need male protection and control due to just... Uh, being weaker was something that was uh, commonly portrayed. Patriarchy varied in different civilizations, obviously some being more strict, as I just mentioned, Athens. Obviously in Sparta, they had more freedom uh, compared to uh, Persia a little bit more. Obviously your social piety, uh, file piety in China. Uh, so different areas uh, have a different way of strictness within that patriarchal system. Interaction of patriarchy and class are the greatest restrictions on the upper class women. So a lot of times, uh, poorer class women had more freedom within a family because they would have to go to the marketplace. They were going to have to do jobs where they were seen in public a lot more, whereas your upper class elites would probably have servants or slaves that would be doing a lot of that work. And so for the women were a lot more secluded. Uh, a change of the case of China. In the Han Dynasty, elite ideas became more patriarchal and linked to Confucianism, who was uh, uh, believed in a strict social order with file piety, uh, but again believed that as, if that social order worked, then there would be harmony in society. Thinking about pairs of opposites applied in unequal terms, men's sphere in public, women's sphere in the domestic life. Uh, so three obediences, women is supported to the father, then the husband, then the son, especially after the son reaches a certain age. Uh, you do even see some women writers, uh, female inferiority reinforced by birth rituals. Uh, there were uh, exceptions to the widespread subordination. A few women had considerable political authority because of uh, either having a weak husband in office or rule or uh, a son who uh, was being raised more by the mother and she would take advantage 
uh, the situation and help her son rise to power. Therefore, she had a lot of say and maybe had a lot of backdoor agreements. And so she gained a lot of power through that. But some women gained some political uh, authority uh, more behind the scenes than anything else. Uh, some writers were praised virtuous women as wise counselors. Honor given to the mothers of some sons because of how great the son might be. Uh, dowry was regarded as a woman's own property, so that's unique. Obviously, certain cultures are deeming a dowry uh, a little bit different. Uh, women valued as textile producers, and a wife had much higher status than a concubine, uh, obviously. All right, changes uh, following the collapse of the Han Dynasty, cultural influence of nomadic peoples who had less restrictions. So by the time we get to the Tang Dynasty, elite women regarded as capable of handling legal and business affairs, even of riding horses. I know that kind of sounds funny that what's it matter if a woman rides a horse, but it was considered more of a male thing to do. And so we'll see this transition into the next one, major signs of weakening patriarchy, the rise of Empress Wu, which we'll learn about in the next dynasty. And then growing uh, popularity of Taoism opened new women's roles as well. So um, you could also throw in their Buddhism as well opening the way. And so we're going to see this transition occur in the next unit. Contrasting patriarchies in Athens and Sparta. Uh, we've already been talking about this for a while now. Uh, Athens increasing limitations on women from 700 to 400 BCE. Uh, we've already talked about how their uh, political life was more to be uh, at home. They were married earlier on. A lot of them not allowed to go outside, a lot of them being forced to bear sons or they might be killed or divorced uh, or neglected. Um, maybe they can negotiate some small contracts, but for the most part, uh, they were involved more within the home than anything else. Uh, of course, in Sparta, uh, things are a little bit different. A militaristic regime, very different from Athens. So the need to counter prominent threat of the Halot Rebellion. Sparta males were seen as the warriors of all. So the situation gave women greater freedom where they were involved with more of a lot of the daily duties and keeping things going. So central female task was reproduction. So that was kind of the same. Men were often preparing for or waging war. So women had a larger role in the household, even to the degree of maybe some of your... Um, uh, some of your political things, helping women helping decide. Sparta, unlike Athens, discouraged homosexuality. And so obviously that's uh, something that Athens uh, had a little bit more freedom in, where Sparta did not. Other Greek states approved uh, some of the types of those relationships. Some of them did not. Greek attitude towards sexual choice was quite casual in the way that they lived. Uh, Rome will be a little bit more strict in these areas, but um, it won't. Um, but there will be parts, especially in your upper elites, that will take on kind of the same thoughts that the Greeks had. Uh, what is more impressive about the classical Eurasian civilizations? Uh, change or enduring patterns that you're going to have, uh, the freedoms that Buddhism is going to give towards women. Uh, how Rome has a unified area and how that brought some of the social aspects together with citizenship. Obviously, we saw in the chapter before your comparison between Buddhism and Christianity and how that helps. And then, of course, um, we've talked in chapter uh, four about the collapse of some of these areas and then just briefly mentioned the collapse of the Han and how afterwards uh, some of women's rights actually get uh, improved. And so what ends up happening, these are all uh, things that you kind of uh, see a little bit of. Uh, but obviously, uh, the main things to focus on, China had that major scholar gentry class. India had the caste system. Uh, slavery largely unquestioned until the 19th century in all areas, even if it was just a minor position within China or India. Patriarchy has been uh, the most fundamental, durable, and assumed feature of all civilizations. Even up until today, there's still women who don't get paid as equally as a man in some jobs. Uh, and then, of course, we're looking at, we're talking about America. There's still a lot of societies throughout the world, world where it's definitely more patriarchal uh, and women just maybe have the right to vote, and that's 
a lot of other freedoms, not so much so. Uh, not effectively challenged until the 20th century. Again, this can be more of a Western idea. Still shapes lives and thinking of the vast majority of the people, as I just mentioned. Religious and cultural traditions started in the classical age and still practiced or honored by hundreds of millions of people. And that will conclude our chapter.